Okay, so I find that this quartrain, uh, quartrain 61 that is, is, um, is quite clear. For some reason, the last quartrain and this one um, hasn't given us like such a, a, a hidden message um, because it, it seems quite clear that what he is talking about is, is a criticism of um, that tendency of thinking, especially in this age, to overanalyze everything until it barely exists. You know, um, it's almost like he's uh, speaking about that to rely exclusively on uh, intellectual exploration of the world is to annihilate the magic of life itself, right? Um, I remember when I was in university, and also I recently uh, read a, a paper, uh, an article, that pretty much concludes that right now, all of the leading universities of the world, the departments that get almost all of the funding from investors, from, you know, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, philanthropists are exclusively STEM related, science, technology, engineering, mathematics. So, and this is not to discount um, the brilliant minds that have studied in those fields, but those fields, uh, I, I, I find that it's hard to argue that those fields don't emphasize kind of like this very analytical black and white view of the world. Like it is this or it is that one cause, one disease, one cure as such. So it's more of like what to think instead of how to think, you know? So I suppose it's not that surprising um, that, that way of thinking, that way of uh, dealing with the world. And also for those of you in families, you probably are a lot more proud of your offsprings if they get into university and, you know, like a DTG choose to study medicine or mathematics or engineering, but you'd likely be a little bit concerned if, hey, I'm gonna study philosophy or art or the sciences, I mean, or music or drama, right? Um, just because I feel like we have just left Kali Yuga so recently in the grand scheme of things that we still crave a way of thinking that is still solid and measurable. Whereas, um, whereas life is just so full of magic and colors that it's, it makes it a little bit, at least to most people, worthless to study stuff like that, you know? But it's, I mean, to speak of magic, if you want to follow me on page um, 249, oh, excuse me, 289, the second paragraph down, the paragraph that begins with in birds, in birds and animals, he projects his consciousness as activity. In the fluting of thrush and nightingale, the infinite silence transforms itself into song. In the gazelles, the cosmic vibration assumes grace and movement. In the antelope speed, in the elephant's power and dignity, many qualities of the divine are revealed in animals and so forth and so forth. It's just so beautiful to think about life and to look at life in that way, um, at least for me. Um, it makes life not so dry. And if, the, if anything, just being on the spiritual path has delivered me from that way of looking at the world, you know, that is so popular right now. Um, so if I were to uh, summarize this in two sentences, I would do so as follows. And, and the second sentence is actually lifted from the expanded meaning. So the, um, the first sentence that I would say is to conclude that consciousness is a product of unconsciousness means that life has no purpose. The awakened soul knows that consciousness did not appear temporarily out of unconsciousness, 
for everything in the universe is an expression of consciousness. Beautiful. Thank you, Jagdish. It reminded me of this uh, part joke uh, which Swami used to narrate in the form of a story that two friends went out fishing and this was happening in the western world which is Swami was uh, poking fun at the, that side of the world and the, the intellectual thinking it brings and Swami said these friends went out fishing and just as one was about to he got a fish you know caught a fish in his dog ran over the water and grabbed the fish and this guy couldn't believe what he was seeing and he turned to his friend he said did you just see what i saw and his friend said yes that stupid thing doesn't know how to swim and uh, swami says that this we live in an age which is very dismissive of subtler realities and dismissive right away but uh, if one has to just probe this question that like swami said why am i thinking why am i conscious where is this power or ability coming from and very quickly one can retrace it to as you said consciousness is at the heart of everything and if and to maybe apply it more practically in our lives are we aware of everything are we aware of our thoughts are we aware that we might now be losing connection like one time there was a monk who master was keeping his aura around him because he knew he was going to leave the path there was a strong reason for that uh, strong uh, you know momentum in that direction and one time this monk uh, there was somebody cracked a joke and everybody laughed and he also laughed very much and he was very hilarious and next day when they met master said to him he said for a few moments yesterday evening i lost connection with you that he had lost his inner awareness and the master kind of keeps it continuous and our responsibility is how can we stay in tune with that awareness all the time through everything. Thank you for sharing Jagdish. Anybody else friends? Yeah, I think it's interesting how, uh, you know, as the squatrain um, kind of uh, reveals that the soul consciousness in man keeps probing for the meaning underneath it all that yes i mean i remember before joining the path i would think you know what is the purpose of life you know you're born you die you go move on what is the purpose of it all what's the point in achieving anything if at the end of it all you have to leave uh, everything behind so it's hard to understand the meaning of life and yet i think that question uh, is the key to uh, to uh, to, 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 to diving into the depths of your own self. Okay, what is that purpose? And so I think it's uh, the whole Leela as that God has created uh, through his consciousness. It's one of the most thrilling plays. I mean, <laughs> uh, the, the way he has hidden meaning in everything and uh, how the soul buried behind all those layers of outer forms uh some uh, material then uh, you know uh, subtle layers of consciousness and how through it all that silent voice keeps um, helping us keep keep egging us on you know through questions to you know find out more and more as we as we grow older and then uh, you know the true uh, childhood begins again as wisdom dawns to man uh, that that's not part of uh, part here of this portion right now, but you just see the um, as people progress on in life, you see that as we become more and more uh, aware, we become also childlike, and uh, that true wisdom is also revealed in that childlike openness to life and at that wonderment of life of its beauty, like you just read from that expanded meaning that the you know how consciousness. Uh, through the gazelle, through the elephant, through the birds, and through all things in creation, actually manifests itself in a very tangible way, um, and you know is speaking to us. Uh, it's it's I, I, I like that aspect of these quatrains that through the outer meaning it is taking us to the inner um, meaning of light and soul. In a subtle way, I also feel that, I mean, here we are in the pandemic, unfortunately, you know, five million people officially have left their bodies through the to this pandemic. But, you know, 
in this verse, it seems like he's suggesting we come from the earth, we go back. And is it just that mechanical? And when we question, why do we have to suffer in life? Well, we don't ask deeper questions by and large, unless some uh, ground shaking disaster comes along. And then you say, wait a minute, what I thought I was in control. I thought I knew it. I was seeing it all. How did this suddenly the reality change so much outwardly? Because underlying consciousness of the planet is changing, of people is changing. And uh, but till that time, we rarely wake up to even question uh, consciousness. Absolutely. I think only when like emergencies arise, you know, it's almost like it's only for, for some people, only when you are about to drown is when the inspiration to learn to swim come about. Right. So then it's um, and I think Aditya, you, you struck on such a good note. And this is not to discount um, science. This is not to be insensitive to anyone who has passed away from, um, from, from this uh, disease. But I, I believe it's this very analytical way of thinking, right? That we must figure out what is killing people that is currently leading us down this path towards um, you know, like the, the most rushed vaccination, the most um, like restricted human movements. And granted, in the grand scheme of things, all of this cannot happen out of divine mother's will. But it is so fascinating that I, I just wonder that if we are at a different stage of the game, if we are more expanded, in other words, if we are not so greedy with our life, if we do not just emphasize in like, we need to figure this out scientifically, what is killing people? I wonder where would we be now, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. Yep, okay, we'll move on. Thank you, Jagdish, on that. Next is Ashwini on 62. Okay, good evening, friends. Hello. <laughs> so, Quatrain 62. Another said, Why near a peevish boy would break the ball from which he drank in joy? Shall he that made the vessel in pure love and fancy in an after rage destroy? Paraphrase. Surely, reflected another truth seeker, no normal human being, however immature, would kill those who have brought him happiness. How could God, who is love itself, feel anger towards us? Would he peevishly destroy the vessel of life which he himself created? In joy, he shaped it delicately and with divine imagination. From this vessel, he drinks our tender feelings of devotion to him. Surely, being all wise, he can only have created death as he did life for some good and worthwhile purpose. So I wanted to read um, another paragraph which Swamiji wrote in Expanded Meaning. Uh, this is on the page 295. Um, yeah. He who made us must surely also love us. His reason for ordaining death as the final act of life must therefore be somehow connected with his love. The death of death itself comes finally for the best of all possible reasons. It is a release when the body at last has served its divine purpose and spiritual perfection has been attained. So what I understood actually after reading this quatrain and especially the uh, what Swamiji has written in the expanded meaning, I wanted to share basically one of my personal story because when I read this quatrain, it struck me very strongly and this uh, story is related to my father and I was very attached to him. 
uh, he is now no more he died four years ago but his death was unexpected and uh, i still remember he traveled from pune to our hometown uh, he traveled overnight he reached there in the morning and after finishing some morning uh, things he went to take a nap and in nap only he died he got a cardiac arrest uh, in that and uh, when he died nobody was with him and it took almost another 7 to 8 hours for us to reach for myself my mother my sister to reach there uh, to my hometown and uh, when we reached there and i saw him this uh, thought strongly came to me that how could god do this to him you know this man helped many people whatever ways he can and at the end of his lifetime nobody was with him he was by all himself and god didn't do this right uh, with him that's the thought you know kept lingering in my mind after that you know for a few months i would say and uh, uh, eventually i joined ananda and then i started taking classes and maybe after uh, finishing my level 2 or maybe in the midway of level 2 when i again went to my hometown i accidentally met the doctor who had given the death certificate of my father and at the end of the conversation he said to me that ashwini your father was very lucky he got a very peaceful and calm death you know uh, no surgery no operation no disease and all that he just went to sleep and then he died and i very uh, i saw such kind of deaths very few in my uh, career you know so when he said that uh, i i uh, felt that all these months what i was thinking it's actually it's not right god has given him a very peaceful and uh, you know calm death and uh, even if nobody was there with him at that time god was definitely there to take care of him and he took care of him very nicely so um, that's the thing and uh, you know this quatrain uh, i don't know why reading uh, this quatrain this uh, all those incidents came again to me and to sum it up this quatrain i would say two lines you know uh, we should always believe uh, that whatever situation god puts us in that is the best situation for us that's the first one and the second uh, thought uh, yeah, uh, or maybe a uh, line is uh, for a soul death is not a not an end it's another beginning so that's the end for quatrain 62 thank you so anyone has any comments on this oh, and also like beautifully i think it was uh, master who said it in a past life but that line is attributed to saint francis of assisi it is in dying that we are born to eternal life that that final passing away conscious passing is going to wake us up in a life you might say from where there is no death which seems very philosophical but every saint swami used to say you may not believe your own mind in its reasoning but he says remember that is the only uh, all saints have agreed unanimously to that they have testified to that so uh, you know where is the sorrow in that kind of a transition you might say don't even feel like calling it death anymore it's waking up and also i think it's the practice of bhakti yoga that when we see with the eyes of love we perceive all things as love and uh, as omar khayyam is reminding us that he who drinks of the love of our devotion through the form this vessel that he has created how can he destroy something from which he drinks in joy uh, which means that what we perceive as something final or dark may simply be uh, as ashwini was mentioning the beginning of a new life and this and you know we see this these principles at work at different levels in life when we are destroying bad habits it creates the energy and space to form new habits to use that energy that prana that life force in new directions so death happens at many levels 
it is um, as christ would uh, say it's when we are not living in god's presence in a sense that's when that's the death that needs to be feared that when we are not living in the light of god that's the death we need to uh, uh, introspect and uh, uh, and uh, dedicate our time and energy to overcoming very consciously and very intently the death that we see at the end of a life lived is simply the beginning of a new uh, you know journey again further so i thought that line that you know to see all things with love to know that god's uh, god's plan is always one of love and i believe that is somewhere in the teachings um either master or swami ji said it i just heard uh, asha ji spoke of it that um she mentioned that whenever there's a funeral on the physical plane there's a birthday party on the astral plane so ashwini um yes it might be just on earth that it might be so disheartening not to be able to reach your father for 72 hours but you can almost think that he got a surprise birthday party <laughs> on the astral plane you know and the best kind of parties are surprise parties when you agree <laughs> that is that is sweet dish <laughs> yeah thank you thank you jagdish should we move to next quatrain yes sashini okay. so quatrain 63 none answered this but after silence spake a vessel of a more ungainly make They sneer at me for leaning all awry. What did the hand then of a potter shake? Paraphrase. None answered, for God's ways are difficult to understand. Death is not life's only paradox. Why are some babies born physically deformed or mentally deficient? It is not easy for the human mind. even after much reflection to understand these mysteries those suffering from such limitations often think people are offended by my deformity but in what way am i to blame perhaps the creator perhaps the creator blundered when he made me and in expanded meaning i want to read this paragraph where swami ji has written its page number 298 only through deep inner communion with higher states of consciousness does it become clear that all deficiencies whether mental or physical are the fair consequences of a person's misbehavior in the past so i feel this is a very easy quatrain <laughs> to understand you know uh, i what i understood is, is uh, in the quatrain or in expanded meaning also swami ji has given um, explanation about the law of karma and uh, uh, that is simply if we saw uh, evil we will reap evil uh, like through in a suffering and if we saw good then we will get goodness uh, in through inner joy so that's that that is what i understood through this quatrain and expanded meaning and to sum it up i would say only one line that every action or thought um which we reap has its uh, corresponding reaction or reward that's it so anyone wants to comment you know there is a story i was trying to remember the story in the bible where you know jesus um during his ministry he would go to villages heal people and that in one of the villages they bring to him a man who has been blind since birth and uh, you know it's clear by now that you know people in that age believed in reincarnation but over the years you know they removed that piece of wisdom from the bible so there the uh, crowd is asking jesus you know why is this man blind what sin has his parents committed what sin is he living out uh, through this blindness 
and uh, Jesus says some, uh, something, I was trying to actually recall that, but he says uh, some challenges that we go through in life, like in this portrait, we are talking about deformity, challenges. Um, some are, of course, we are living out our past karma, we are resolving, harmonizing our actions and thoughts of the past. And in some, as Christ told, responded in that particular situation, he said, through some challenges, the divine is trying to uh, show his miracles, show his glory. Uh, that sometimes, uh, you know, for man, as uh, Christ himself said, why does it always take a miracle for man to believe in a higher consciousness, for man to believe in a higher potential in himself and in others? And sometimes through these challenges, I think in our contemporary times, one of the most uh, well-known and popular examples is that of the, uh, you know, a man from Yugoslavia who was probably, I think, born without his arms and his feet. And he's become a very well-known preacher, uh, uh, preaching Christ, uh, goodness, a uh, life in God. So despite that uh, tremendous handicap with which he was, he, he was born, he has converted that life into one of opportunity, one of success, one of overcoming a miracle, uh, uh, you know, a miracle in progress. So I think, so when we look at challenges, it's also to remember that until we are presented with challenges in life, we ourselves do not have the incentive or the motivation to bring out the light within us. Yes, there is a past karma and energy that we're trying to resolve, but also to look at it as an opportunity for shining God's light through which God's power and glory can come through. Let me check what was it that Christ said in that. Yes, anybody else for comments? Did he say something like so that uh, like the Father may be glorified, God may be glorified, you know, that or the Son of God? That God may be glorified in you through your, yeah, something of that. He the same for Lazarus also, no, Daisy? Yeah. The sisters asked, why did our brother die? He was a good man because they were disciples of Christ. Yes. And he says, you will soon see it is for the glorification of God. And to, to this day, that story stands. <laughs> yeah. To add on I, a I, little I, more subtle uh, flavor to this, uh, the, the, the quote that, um, sorry. I'm taking inspiration from Ashaji's latest talk. In if, if you look on YouTube, one of her latest talks is on um, Swamiji's book in Divine Friendship and the theme of this talk is to face uh, suffering I believe and a big chunk of it has to do with death. In it she actually spoke about um, a fascinating account of a very young saint. I do believe if I, if I remember it correctly that Swamiji actually met her. So um, uh, this saint actually, you know, grew up in a typical family and at about the age of 10 decided to go in her bedroom and she never left. She told her parents that, please bring me food every day. And from then on, she was in seclusion. And word got around that, um, that she was in seclusion, that uh, she has high spiritual powers. So people began to uh, ask her for prayers, for healing prayers and, and so forth. And um, they were healed. Now, oddly enough, uh, her father was sick, very sick, an invalid at home. And she uh, has always refused to heal her own father, um, but didn't give a reason why. I believe after Swamiji met her, she was later found to be weeping in front of a statue of Krishna, right? And sometime during then, she decided to heal her father after, not, after kind of ignoring her family's pleas for so long. But immediately after that, her father began to go awry. Like he began to really pursue a very worldly, sensual life. And the recollection was that, you know, it was his karma to be sick this lifetime and that was keeping him um, away from this very worldly sensual existence. 
Um, but after this, uh, after our daughter healed him, he went awry. And after that, she also passed away. So it was a very, um, yeah, a fascinating story that, uh, that I just want to share with you guys. It is uh, one of Ashiki's latest talks on YouTube. You can find it, How to Face Suffering. Thank you, Jagdish. And here, here is that uh, story from the Bible. So I'll just read as it is said. And as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither has this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. Okay. Yeah. Silver and share. Yeah. Sir. Aditya ji, see, ordinary people generally think, suppose they are handicapped or some sort of sufferings, they always blame the God. They say, why God has given me this suffering? What have I done? Because they don't know what they had done. Whatever they sowed in the past, it is just now they are reaping. But only a saint can explain to them that is what has happened to you in the past, what you have done, and this is what reflected in this part. See, there was one saint, uh, Sadaswa Brahmendra Swamigal. You know, after meeting Ramana Magarishi, our master went to that place where his samadhi is there. So that uh, uh, Sadaswa Brahmendra Swamigal was a great saint, and he was always uh, uh, in the super consciousness stage. He was not an ordinary person. So he will be moving sometimes. You know, he never asks anything. Uh, he will be roaming here and there. And sometimes he does not even wear dresses or anything. So one man was you know, annoyed by his appearances. And he simply cut his uh, you know, hand from the shoulder. His hand came out. But that Swamigal was, you know, he does not remember anything. He was simply walking. So on seeing that, that man was bewildered and uh, he took the hand and uh, went there and, uh, you know, he has fallen on his feet and told him, Swamiji, what happened? I have, uh, I have done the greatest mistake. Forgive me. Swami asked him, what happened? So I cut your hands. You know, one of your hands I have cut off. Then Swamiji said, okay, you put it there. That man just uh, put it in the same place and it, he became normal. The saint became normal. So that was the power that saint was having. And um, so ordinary people and saints, we cannot compare with them. So generally common people will always blame the God. Why, what, why it has come to me? What it has come to me? As, as soon as he said, you know, um, her father's uh, you know, peaceful death, it is a blessing. You know, he might have taken due to a lot of incarnations we take. Every birth, you know, suppose we added our karma in the positive way. Then naturally, our uh, evil effects of karma is reduced, and uh, generally, we are our souls are also reformed, and we are on the right path towards the kingdom of heaven. We can say, or kingdom of heart, God. So that is what uh, happened in uh, Ashwini's father's the death also. So he had a very peaceful and uh, blessed, uh, his blessed soul. We can say it is a blessed soul. So uh, here in this uh, uh, quatrain, that man says, "No, why I am suffering." I have to leave it to the God has made me like this. So actual reason is not like that. God, God is made for some reasons only. That's what I believe. So we have to meditate. Even though Swamiji says in this uh, parallel, Lord, see God in the inner silence, reconcile yourself to what is and to what needs to be done about it. You can reshape every karma provided, provided that from today onward, you live by soul consciousness. Repudiate the uh, no. Repudiate the dictates of your ego. They are forever grounded in delusion. That's what he says in the para lost para of two ninety eight. Beautiful. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everyone. This was. Good. Thank you, Ashwini. We'll move on to the next and one. Actually, yeah, just to add a little bit, please, over there, that sometimes, you know, like that story Jagdish you mentioned, is that illness, that's why Master called his healing practices divine will healing. 
that the human mind somehow always equates uh, absence of disease as a good thing which in god's plan also it is however illness also has its a reason why it has come and it's like a little break on somebody's let's say bad karma or the momentum of bad karma that if you have a bad lifestyle you will fall ill a few times before the final heart attack comes or you know so those things are things the mental issues also sometimes that who knows how far that person would have gone if their mind would have still been healthy or the body was cooperating so at the end of you know certain uh, trends of not living by dharmic ways illness comes to apply breaks for others welfare for your own <laughs> welfare and then you pick it up again in another lifetime master says so it's very interesting and the good thing was master or swami was explaining over there that it's not easy to understand the human mind just finds it very hard on one level rightly so to see little children with deformities and such and you say why did this happen but there's a, either there's a reason behind everything or there's no reason behind anything thank you brother so we'll go on to quadrant 64 this one says said one folks of a solely tapster tell and dob his visage with the smoke of hell They talk of some strict testing of us. Pish, he's a good fellow, and it will all be well. The paraphrase: Some people think of God as a solely disciplinarian, strict in his demands of us, exacting in his punishments, and prompt to revenge the slightest evidence in us of unbelief. A tyrant, in short, who tests people with suffering, judges their behavior with heartless scrutiny. and condemns them to eternity in hell for being merely human to the sincere seeker opinions concerning the infinite are irrelevant can a person living living in a room of mirrors see anything beyond its reflections fish says wisdom to the nonsense with which the ego self enclosed in its spiritual ignorance so often prattles of divine truths yeah isn't it amazing how we can uh, pronounce or declare a judgment or opinion with very little understanding of it <laughs> in life there is so much we find of it around us uh, even in ourselves we barely know anything of a situation but we feel we know and it is one of the one of the manifestations of ignorance when we think we know as it is said in the scriptures god says your thoughts are not my thoughts your ways are not my ways and there is a story that uh, yogananda ji uh, uh, you know uh, swami ji writes about yogananda where um, i think he visits this man whose son um, uh, who is very unhappy with his son i think brother maybe i don't know if you remember the story you can correct me i'm speaking from a uh, long memory uh, some time past of reading it so he is uh, so this man has a son who is very unhappy with because he has uh, strayed from a good life and he is wasting his life and so he is a little unhappy and he feels um uh, and he feels and he is also unhappy with god that uh, you know god has tested him that way and that god is a tyrant and then master says uh, you know why don't you um, why don't you bring a big oven uh you remember the story brother i don't you, i maybe you can say no, maybe i'll share it here yeah. yeah. so anyway master became friend with this priest who was i think a maybe a fundamentalist priest and uh, because they were friends master and master knew what the challenge is master just said to him uh, he said oh sir i have a very hard life and master says your son gives you trouble doesn't he and he says oh yes he does and master said i have a solution for him he said do you i would be so happy if you provided the solution and master said yeah. so he said what what can we do sir he says yeah before that tell me do you have an oven in your house and this man said oven he said yes i do have an oven and swami says is it uh, can it get very high in temperature and is it big enough uh, for a person to get in there 
this man says i don't know what you're trying to say but it is quite big and he says okay so tonight when before your son comes fire up the oven keep it red hot and just and i'll come to your house and just as your son comes we are going to push him and throw him inside this oven and by this time this priest said how dare you how dare you? get out of my house how dare you suggest such a thing to me and of course what master was trying to do is correct the understanding religious unfortunately a religious understanding in that fundamentalist priest that if we don't listen to god he is going to throw us in eternal hellfire which was part of his worry that my son has strayed he is going to be burning for eternity and then master would say the thing that you know if you as an earthly father couldn't bear to throw your son in an oven how do you think that the heavenly father can do that to us his children and of course it came back to the law of karma that some used to say and i'll close with this that suffering seems like eternal or it it's it continues it never ends but it's it is not like that good things come and go very quickly in our memory but it feels like suffering is just not ending that's why it was called eternal hell fire but how can a finite cause no matter what it be lead to an infinite punishment <laughs> just doesn't work like that thank you brother that was well narrated so tapster here is actually a tavern keeper the keeper of a, the inn so so to sum up this uh, to sum up this quatrain um, omar khayyam is talking about how in the ignorance uh, how in ignorance we uh, judge according to our own consciousness that when we are unkind we think everybody else is being unkind we think god is unkind um uh, we are judgmental we think god is judgmental that if we don't do things a certain way god is going to be angry he is going to seek revenge by bringing suffering on us so suffering is looked at as a revenge rather than an opportunity to reform or to transform ourselves so this is a, this this is the dark whale of ignorance and uh, here at the end the last line he says the word fish which is saying that oh what worthless nonsense that the ego unable to rise any higher in its understanding is coloring all with its dark brush of uh, hell fire and judgment and uh, you know darkness but he's saying it will all be well that god is good he is all goodness and it's all for the good i would like to open it up to anyone else who may need, want to share something Do we all think that this uh, very severe view of God is a reflection on how we view ourselves as a culture? In other words, like we've heard before, surely that God made um, everyone, men and women, in His own image, right? But this view, this very severe view of Him, did we make Him from our image? What do you think? absolutely i feel that so you know we project you might say the human our human foibles onto god uh, we see him with that lens we are seeing one another with and it's unfortunate because he's beyond all that like master said that's the challenge for us to even understand um, it was a challenge swami says to understand what master was or like master couldn't express his love even sometimes to many disciples because it had to go through the filter of the ego or likes and dislikes and sometimes his firmness was an expression of love but people didn't take it well and tenderness can be an expression of lack of love you might say because it doesn't correct us so it uh, but god is uh, but the guru is beyond these three gunas you might say and certainly god is also beyond the gunas but we project different cultures see him you know there's a very interesting book called how god changes our brain by a neuroscientist uh, dr andrew newberg who came in this january in our health event also and he did a study of cultures uh, across the world and how they look at god and his uh, punishment you might say or his nature and he found out that people when they thought god was vengeful and he was going to clap you in hell and all that they not only had fear consciousness with god uh, thinking of god but actually their brains were different 
compared to other people who thought God was loving and forgiving and motherly and kind. And he says that we have, a, or you might say we have a certain way of thinking and it affects our brain in a certain way. So it's not healthy for our brain also to think of God in unhealthy ways. And also it's interesting how this lack of harmony and understanding between God and man actually leads to problems in the world. We have seen how the saints have been crucified. In fact, when Christ was crucified, it uh, reflected also in all of creation. Rocks as in the distant parts of the world were cleaved. You know, the curtain of the temple, it is said, was, uh, you know, split into two. And so the saint whose consciousness is one with God, when we try to uh, harm or seek revenge on that consciousness, we see those repercussions in all of nature. But uh, yet, even while we like to uh, push that darkness upon God and blame God for any darkness in our life, uh, it is uh, unfortunate. It is an unfortunate reality that man perpetuates that darkness by his own thoughts and his own actions, and then says. What is this world that God has created? It is so chaotic. There is no peace and it's full of strife. And it's actually a function of man's consciousness, this harmonious consciousness that is actually keeping the world in such chaos. Aritya ji, sir. Aritya ji? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, as uh, Aditya ji said in the last quadrant, when he was explaining, you know, father does not want to put his son into the oven. So just like that, you know, God will never like any of his children to suffer. That is correct. And Swamiji has clearly said, instead of blaming God, and you go to the God for solutions, to put, you place the problems before God, and you request for his solutions, he will help you. That's what he has mentioned in... Um, 302 page number, um, I think one, two, three, fourth para. Instead of theorizing about the nature of God, turn to him for solutions to your every problem, no matter how mundane. The more faithfully you continue your meditation practices, meditation practices, the greater the results you will experience. So to get good results or to come out of this vicious circle, meditation is the best way. That's what Swamiji suggests in this paragraph. Yeah, it's like that's a drawback of the human mind uh, beyond a point. It keeps questioning and doubting. And I think Swami is also writing this because he himself, he said, uh, he said, uh, you know, he said, I always try to avoid God in his earlier part of life. He said, but I'm so glad I failed in my attempts that finally he nothing else would work. So he turned to God and he turned so deeply, desperately. He said he had so many doubts early in this life. And especially master said in some distant past lives that Swami said that uh, he knew that this kind of blame came or doubts, worries doesn't help. Turn to God, work with Him, listen to Him. He says, what else is our option? I wonder why Satan is so charismatic, you know? Why, why is the bad stuff so much easier to believe than the good stuff, right? It's so fascinating. I mean, I, I fall prey to it. Um, not not ashamed to admit it, but then at least being on this path, I catch it pretty quickly. But that's not to say I awaken from it immediately. I still want to take a peek and look and you're like, you know, this is not worth it, but it's oddly entertaining. That that that's I think what what I want to share. Um, but at least I know that not to take it so seriously. But man, it's it's just so so tempting. To, to turn your back on the light. Yeah, it's because Master said partly, no, he said because we are coming from a lower consciousness, you might say in the past, we are slowly waking up. So there's past familiarity. There's a past magnetism over there. Of course, now there is the conscious awareness that no, I don't want it. But like, in, I think it will come in my reading this time or next, it says a constant battle. That anytime you let your guard loose, 
uh, you know, in this world of duality, it's like the past comes up to again say, hey, 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 what about this? <laughs> it's like habits, they start talking to you <laughs> and you have to keep in conscious awareness. Okay. Yeah, that's a very interesting point you brought up, uh, Jagdish. Thank you. So to sum up the quadrant, I would say to remind ourselves that God is all goodness and not to judge with the consciousness of ego, which is dark until it is purified in the light <laughs> and therefore the magnetism towards darkness. All right. Okay. So I think we are two minutes away from our closing time. So maybe we can take up the other quatrains in the next, uh, you know, after our Diwali break, we will have a short Diwali break. For those who are just joining us, really sorry, we are at the close of the book study today, but we will be back next week as a Diwali break. So we want to wish everyone a very, very happy Diwali. And may that light of God and Gurus fill our consciousness, our soul, and maybe rise in that light this week and in the days and months to come. So have a wonderful time and we'll be we will keep you all in our prayers. Thank we'll you. We call a happy day. Thank, Thank you. Happy Diwali, everybody. Happy Diwali, everybody. Good night. Bye-bye. Good night. Good night.